Hello again, this is Professor Zafari, and in this lesson, let's talk about ancient Rome. As we spoke of the ancient Greeks, we discussed classicism and defined classicism and explored how it is the overriding ideology that connects the architecture and connects the sculpture and the philosophy of the ancient Greeks. So let's have a similar discussion about the ancient Romans and what their overriding philosophy is. For the Romans, utilitarianism is the term, is the concept and ideology that really characterizes their culture. So to define utilitarianism, we can say it is an ethical framework and it's based on defining good in terms of utility. So if we want to define utility, then we can define it as happiness. That's not a comprehensive definition, but for the time being, utility can be defined as happiness. And for utilitarianism, it is the effort to achieve the greatest good, the most happiness for the greatest number. So utilitarianism is based on trying to make life better, trying to um, create the most pleasurable, the most useful uh, items for the largest number of people. And for utilitarianism, the end justifies the means. And we can see this in the Romans concept of Pax Romana. Pax Romana was not necessarily the most compassionate policy. It came at the expense of oppressing the minorities. But for the Romans, this was justified because it then imposed a type of peace that, that served a larger number of people. So they were seeking to, seeking to create happiness, create peace for the largest number of people. So this then is the framework for the Romans ideology and culture and what utilitarianism then means as far as cultural achievements is that the Romans were very willing to assimilate influences whenever they encountered them. So we can definitely see that they were very much influenced by the ancient Greeks. They were also in, uh, influenced by the ancient Phoenicians. They were they were influenced by many of the cultures in which they came into contact. And for the Romans, there was nothing wrong with this. It was actually the opposite. If it is something that's already available and it is going to provide a benefit, why not? The development of law. We might not think of law as a significant cultural achievement, but it is. And for the Romans, paying as much attention as they did to law illustrates their utilitarianism. They are putting effort into an aspect of society, an aspect of their culture that is going to have a significant impact on a large number of people. We can also see the Romans' utilitarianism in their architectural and engineering triumphs. In these two forms of culture, architecture and engineering, we see that the Romans are really trying to develop a sophisticated society, not simply to be aesthetically pleasing, but to provide a higher quality of life for the people living in their empire. So let's take a look at some examples of the utilitarianism of the Romans at work. This is the Pont du Gard, a 2,000-year-old aqueduct near Nîmes in France, which has become one of this country's most popular attractions. A critical priority for any city is a constant supply of fresh water. And the covered trough at the top of the Pont du Gard was once part of a 30-mile-long aqueduct that brought water to Nîmes from high up in the mountains. The key to aqueduct design is gravity. Once the engineers located a source of water in the mountains, they built their aqueduct with a gentle downward slope to ensure that the water would flow along its entire length. The aqueduct rested on a series of arches which were supported above the varying terrain on massive stone piers. 
But when the aqueduct had to cross a river or a ravine and it became either impossible or impractical to build those stone piers, the engineers instead built larger arches. And if necessary, they built several larger arches, such as we see here at the Pont du Gard. An arch is composed of separate wedge-shaped blocks that are cut and fitted together in a curve. The blocks are held in place by a wooden frame until they are locked together at the top with a keystone. The weight of the arch at the top presses down and pushes the sides outward. But when you support these sides, the outward forces are counteracted. Now the wooden centering can be removed because the entire structure is stable. And with this design, the Romans could span almost any terrain. The Romans didn't invent the arch, but once they understood its potential, they used it again and again to span both interior and exterior space and to carry water literally hundreds of miles if that's what was needed. loved spectator events, but only cities were large enough to build, support, and fill theaters. Like so much else, the Romans borrowed most of their dramatic themes from the Greeks, modifying them to suit their own tastes and sensibilities. They produced comedies, tragedies, musical reviews. They brought in acrobats, jugglers, pantomimes, and orators to lecture on honor, duty, country, and of course, the glory of being Roman. Virtually all communities had a theater, and some were quite large and impressive. This theater in Orange, France, could hold 10,000 people. It was a gift from Augustus, whose heroic statue still adorns the rear stage wall, decorated with elaborate marble columns. The theater was a popular form of entertainment, drawing many people from the city and the surrounding countryside. But the really big crowds came to the amphitheaters. This huge amphitheater is in Nîmes, not far from Orange. It could easily hold the 24,000 spectators who came here to watch the games. When you first entered the amphitheater, you started in this covered passageway, which rings the entire arena. You get to your seats through these barrel vaulted tunnels. Some go up to the cheap seats, others go down to the box seats, closer to the action. Like a modern stadium, this is the area where you'd find the snack bars and public toilets. This barrel vault above me does two things. First of all, it creates a covered passageway, but second, it acts as an extended arch to support the tremendous weight above. An amphitheater is actually a circle of barrel vaults that narrow as they lead to the arena. These are connected to rings of passageways that allow movement around the entire structure. The system was so efficient that the whole place could be emptied in 15 minutes. Stone seats rested on top of these vaults, and along the back wall was a series of masts which were rigged to hold a massive canopy called a valerian. architecture. The Romans are perhaps the first civilization who really capitalized on the power of art and specifically sculpture to be a form of propaganda. And so we see in Roman sculpture that we, we find many portraits. They're portraits of rulers. They're meant to glorify the rulers and, and provide this form of propaganda to show the, the magnificence and the power and, and the significance of that ruler. And we also see this utilitarian use of architecture to serve as a mean of propaganda with rulers creating public buildings, arches to glorify themselves. So we can see here in this, uh, in this sculptural portrait, this idea of propaganda, but we can also see it in the architecture. So here, for example, 
is the arch and it's the same location that the narrator was just explaining in Nîmes, outside of Nîmes, France. But these these arches were not only useful, they were also decorative. So a conquering emperor, for example, might create a triumphal arch to celebrate his triumph. And it's this Roman piece of architecture that, that inspired the French, the famous French work of architecture, the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, France. And as we just saw, the barrel vault is another development of Roman architecture. Very useful, very utilitarian in that it not only provides a covered passageway, but it bears weight in a very useful manner. And we'll see that the barrel vault is going to be an architectural development that future civilizations are going to employ. We'll see a t style of architecture develop in the medieval era that's called Romanesque, Roman-like. And they'll use the barrel vault and they'll add to it multiple lobes and they'll create a rib vault with a little bit of a ridge at the top. So we'll see that the barrel vault is an architectural design that is going to inspire future generations as well. We also have the very famous Pantheon with its magnificent arches and its dome in the center. Significant and unique to the to the Pantheon is the opening in the in the center of the dome called the oculus that allowed light to enter. The Imperial Forum was another major triumph of Roman architecture and also served as a form of propaganda. With its massive size, as we can see here in the scale, the Forum was a place of government, it was a place of pleasure, and it was also a place to really impress upon people the, the power and the grandiosity of their ruler. This is an aerial picture of Rome, and you see here the Colosseum, and to give you a perspective of the, of the scale and, and the size of the forum, you can see here in this, in this drawing. It's a really massive structure that's meant to inspire awe, and it's meant to serve the people. It's meant to provide happiness and good for the largest number of people. So as we conclude these thoughts about the Romans, we know that the Romans did not produce a system of thought or, or present us with any philosophers as significant as Plato or as Aristotle, but they definitely were not without accomplishments. So what are those main achievements of the Romans? By the end of this lesson, you should be able to define, explain those achievements, and what I'd especially like you to be able to do is to explain how these cultural achievements exemplify the Romans' ideology of utilitarianism.